Welcome back. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're discussing building unity in the Catholic Church pursuant to the codes, regulations, and laws of the uh, Catholic Church. Your two principal building blocks, and just like you have uh, a uh, post and cross beam, and basic architecture, post, cross beam, uh, are goodness and truth. Essentially, that's the two processions from the Godhead. Goodness that you know as the Holy Spirit uh, proceeds from the act of God's will. Truth, which you know, come to know as Jesus Christ, is an act of God's intellect. So we're building with these building blocks, truth and goodness. So here we'll take a little deeper dive into the building of unity, the bishop's staff. This is by Archbishop O.V. Cruz. He worked in Rome. He's a lawyer, canon law lawyer, worked at in the appellate courts, worked at many levels at the Vatican. I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep, says the Lord. John 10, 11, 15. I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep, says the Lord. How many of us can say that we have a good shepherd in our parish? As a pastor, as deacons, priests, or in the diocese as a bishop, or as the staff that support them. I am the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep, says the Lord. That's the test. Here are some of the job descriptions. Teacher of doctrine. Shepherds of the Lord's flock. God is love. Specification of rights, rights and duties, values of human rights, the value of human rights. Here you go again, truth, justice, and freedom. And we, we have to think in terms of when building unity, there's a temptation to purchase peace at the cost of an individual happiness, at the cost of the community's happiness, at the cost of an individual, your individuals, you as individuals, laity, at the cost of your happiness, does the shepherd seek unity and will trade your happiness, your eternal happiness, for his peace? The two sins that the priest, the pastor has to be aware of is presumption and despair. That it's hopeless, the sin of despair. Presumption that is, I've got this all right. Going through these doctrines, this code, this zoning code, the Boca code, these rules that the church gives us helps us fight, helps us help our shepherds fight against the two sins of presumption and despair. Here we go presentation. If you obey my teachings, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. How many times we've been opposed with the concept, oh, you're too legalistic. Look at this. If you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 32. We respond to that. When you're building unity, keep that in mind. Truth is formidable. It is forceful. It is insistent. Deliberate attempts may be made to keep it to oneself and to hide it from others. Decisive efforts can even be intentionally undertaken to cover it up well and bury it deeply. But as though having a life of its own, truth eventually comes out in the open and shows itself for everyone else to know and appreciate. The fact is that truth outlives lying and deceptive people. After much, after such people have passed away 
and have themselves been deeply buried, the truth they hid and kept eventually emerges alive and well. Fooling around with truth is futile. So we remind that to the pastors and their staff. The sin of presumption that you believe that you can hide the truth, be unburdened by the past, trade the happiness of your parishioners for peace. Let me go on. And we're dealing with those who want unity at all costs. There are also instances when the truth is not duly perceived and understood for some time or for one reason or another. This is certainly not a matter of altogether ignoring a known truth or intentionally avoiding the knowledge thereof. Much less is it a question of simply playing deaf and dumb. But even in this case, through its own moral force and objective validity, truth has a way of making itself known, sometimes progressively, at times immediately. The end result is the same. Visualize, truth is out. Very powerful. I've experienced that. People we work with experience that in our own parish. Avoiding the knowledge of truth. Ignoring a known truth. Intentionally avoiding the knowledge of, their, of the truth. Not a way to build unity. When truth is out, this is a signal occasion to banish not only ignorance, but also to do away with indifference. So powerful. When truth is out, this is a signal occasion to banish not only ignorance, but also to do away with indifference. Not to know or not to mind the truth is a big ethical impediment to thinking right and acting accordingly. Very powerful. Not to know or not to mind the truth is a big ethical impediment to thinking right and acting accordingly. The intellect is a superior human faculty and its nature and finality are precisely to know the truth. When this is known, the human person is free at last, free to correct mistakes, free to decide according to the dictates of reason, and free to will, free to act, and move forward with conviction and resolve. Powerful. For those of you who, uh, they want to build unity without your family, without your loved ones, this is powerful. They want to eradicate the memory of your family and your loved one. This is powerful. What is the truth that should be pointed out? That must be known and accordingly acted upon, particularly through the leadership of competent church authorities, together with their immediate clerk, religious, and lay leading co-workers in the work of a better implementa implementation, religious and, and lay leaders, lay leading co-workers in the work of a better implementation of the gospel truths. Here he's, he's talking about the Philippine society, but this is a society, and these are universal. He's an archbishop. What is the truth that should be pointed out that must be known and accordingly acted upon, particularly through the leadership of competent church authorities? Competent church authorities? Together with their immediate cleric, religious, and lay leading co workers in the work of a better implementation of the gospel truths? It is the following as hereby earnestly and sincerely submitted in terms of general premises, concrete situations, and particular truths. And then he will go on, and I'll cherry-pick a few of these. But you're looking for competent leaders. What happens if you don't have a competent leader? You talk about it. It's a truth that has to be discussed. Let's go and just cherry-pick a few of these ideas. Truth in particular. Remember, Institute of Catholic Architecture Unity, Building Unity, this is the map, of the map of knowledge that you're to follow in building unity, truth and goodness. In other words, the baptized Catholics in the country have made their faith primarily a personal matter and their morals as a basically private concern. There's dichotomy between their faith and actions, their morals and actuations, on proviso that they go to church, say their prayers, and fulfill their pious obligations they think and feel that they have done all. The majority of the local church leaders, meantime, the bishops in particular, together with their respective clergy, still perform the usual centuries-old routine 
agenda of preaching religiosity, teaching piety, promoting charities, by no means is this long-standing pastoral program wrong. It is right, but sadly deficient. It has to be done, and yet something more should be done. The something more is what you're seeing in the Pope, the great St. John Paul II, since Vatican II, actually. Uh, something more. In other words, the social dimension of Catholic faith and morals, by and large, appears to be lost long since absent from the Episcopal ministry. Episcopal ministry is your bishop's ministry. Episcopal ministry, as well as from the priestly service in the country. This has special relevance in the promotion of justice. This is special relevance in the promotion of justice based not only on the dictates of reason, but premised as well in the paratives of the gospel. Can't build unity without reason. Can't build unity without justice. Can't build unity without by ignoring the imperatives of the gospel. Just say, let it be. Can't do it. Forbidden. This is your blueprint. Here, let's continue. It has to be said that as of this writing, the Episcopal and priestly ministry for justice in the country is not only difficult, but also has danger, but also dangerous. Now he's talking about this ministry of justice, this priestly ministry, the pre, to priest, for priests to get involved, it's dangerous and difficult. He acknowledges that. This is the case whenever the fact of injustice has already taken deep root in both civil, local, and national governance. Injustice has taken deep root, and it's taken deep root into the church. It means when a priest speaks out about justice, it's difficult and dangerous because injustice is so embedded. When public power and influence are basically unjust, the ministry of justice on the part of church leaders becomes a big risk. And I suggest that's a great opportunity for lay people to step forward. It's difficult and risky for church leaders. Build unity, yes, is how you do it. It is good to take note as of a basic truth. Justice is the concern of both church and state. You can't, you just can't get away from that. Unity, got to deal with this. It is good to take note of a basic truth. Justice is the concern of both the church and the state. And you laity can take a lot of the difficulty and the risk away from the clergy. We'll talk about that later by getting involved. Had Christ not preached about justice as founded on truth, nor acted on the demands of truth that promote justice, he would not have been crucified. Now you see that in our own parish where they've diminished the size of the cross. Father Joe's feminized his cross over there in, in Grand Blanc. And ours, we have the cross that we received. They put on the back of the wall and they now have a, a risen Jesus and a, and, a, and a very small cross. Had Jesus not preached about justice as founded on truth, nor acted on the demands of truth and promote justice, not just preach, but he acted. He just didn't preach. He suffered for his path, uh, for, his, for the young. How do you suffer in our parish at Holy Redeemer? Let the elderly use the bathroom. Get behind the bulletproof glass. Get be, Open the door. Let them use the bathroom. Something as simple as that. You want them to hobble all the way to the back? They'll stop going to Mass. Had Christ not preached about justice as founded on truth, not accepted on the demands, nor acted on the demands of truth, that promotes justice. That promote justice, he would not have died on the cross. He would not have been crucified. Let's continue. And this is O.V. Cruz's hallmark. He's got, we had a tape up on him. The purely vertical approach to men and women, exclusively in terms of their relationship with God, is irrelevant to love of neighbor. The mere horizontal concern about men and women, purely in terms of their interactions with one another, is in turn irrelevant to the love of God. The cross is a merge of both the vertical and horizontal. It mess it if it message it should say its message is loud and clear. Genuine love of God necessarily includes love of neighbor. Real love of neighbor cannot but include the love of God. The ministry for justice is in service to man in the name of God. Open up your doors and let the elderly use the bathroom. That's been the past practice in the front of the church. They don't have to go to the back. Let the 24-7 people that would give out food 24-7 come back. 
Let them do that. You've taken that away. You've taken so much away. You've got to accept the demands. You've got to accept the potential for being crucified. Preach the cross. Amen.